Roland Krybik was one of the most fascinating people I have ever known. The audio that follows is a collection of wartime stories that I recorded with him in 2002 and 2003, shortly before his death. In these recordings he recalls his days during World War II, when as a young man, he served in the German army on the Eastern Front. You will hear how after boot camp, Roland refused officer training, and was sent to a mine-clearing penal battalion near Stalingrad. After refusing officer training a second time, he was trained as a medic and served the remainder of the war in the infantry. There, over the next four years, he was wounded several times, was awarded the Iron Cross for heroism, survived a plane crash, escaped Russian and British prison camps, and witnessed Soviet tanks annihilate his battalion. Roland was born in 1922 in the village of Glazerd in a region of Eastern Europe known as the Zudetenland. Although this was a contested area alternatively claimed by the Austrians, Germans and the Czechs, Roland considered himself to be Austrian. In 1938, when he was 16, this Sudeten region was ceded to Germany, in an ill-fated attempt to prevent another war. When World War II ended, this Sudetenland became part of Czechoslovakia. The Czechs then drove the German-speaking people from the region, in a largely secret campaign that resulted in the displacement of an estimated 2 million people and 240,000 deaths. The Krybik family lost everything they owned. On the day of his high school graduation in 1941, Roland and his 34 male classmates were drafted to serve in the army of a country to which they had no allegiance. Nine of these classmates did not come home. Although these tapes focus on the war years, Roland's post-war exploits were equally memorable. He eventually obtained a doctorate in forensic chemistry, emigrated to Canada and ultimately the United States. There he became a world-class chemist, pioneering the development of adhesives for the manufacture of plywood and other wood products. I was his colleague and became his friend during those days. Roland was a gifted storyteller, and most of the audio that follows is his voice. When these recordings were made, Roland was in the late stage of lung cancer. In some of the audio, the toll of his lung cancer is evident. Toward the end he could only speak a word or two between breaths. Voiceover is used only where the original audio was not usable or only a transcript was available. This audio collection is divided into seven parts. If you don't have time to listen to all the recordings, I suggest that you at least listen to episode 3, The Worst Day. That story is one that might seem unbelievable to those of us who have never seen war. But it is a story that needs to be heard by future generations, and their leaders, confronted with decisions surrounding armed conflict. In April 1941, I was given my first high school diploma, and as we came home at lunchtime, we saw the mailman delivering our draft notices. I had not quite 24 hours to pack my bag and jump on the train to join the German army. When drafted into the heavy artillery, this means 6 inches diameter, and this supposedly, as I found out later, was the result of my, at that time, very excellent physical health and fitness. I was drafted to report in Insterburg, which at that time was a city on the Polish-Russian border near the Baltic Sea. The first two, three weeks passed with typical freshmen training with a lot of sore parts of the body. After the three weeks, I was transferred for no reason that I could understand, but it didn't matter. I was transferred to the light field artillery, which is the 10.5, which is the 10.5 centimeter, which means the shells now only weigh 18 kilo instead of 40, 43 kilo or something like that. During the end of the first four weeks, we had our first sharpshooting, and in Germany this is different than here. We do not have unlimited space. We do not have that luxury. 
So the area between two highways is normally blocked off, and they hope that nobody makes a mistake in directing their howitzers and causing any problem. I was K2, which means the individual who is responsible on the second gun for direction, meaning side and elevation. Now, the way this works is you get a number from an officer behind you, and with this number, you do all sorts of things. One of the things I did was to put it on my shield in chalk, so you cannot forget it. And then this number gives you the foundation for doing everything else. The battery, in the German artillery, it worked from the right to the left. The gun most right was gun one, then the second one was the next to it, toward the left, that was gun two, the third one was gun three, and the one on the left was gun four. So it's one, two, three, four, with one, the one on the right, with four, the one on the left. All the guns were in position, the shells were put in, the cartridges were put in, and the first salvo went out, and immediately the message came from the observation station that only three shells had arrived. One shell was obviously missing. So there was, of course, great confusion and great roar about this. The question was, what happened to the fourth to the fourth shell? The thing was repeated, and on the second salvo, or for the second salvo, I should say, they were very careful that a shell went into each barrel. And again, the news was the same. Only three shells had arrived. Great concern and great discussion went on. At that time, a motorcycle rider arrived in great hurry and said, yelling out, stop shooting, stop shooting. You're shooting down my barn. You're shooting down my hen house. You're shooting down my house. So, now came the great exploration of numbers. Numbers had to be compared and taken down. Obviously, and you might anticipate that, it was my gun that stood the wrong way. It was my gun that was shooting down his barn, his hen house, and everything else that was in it. So, I was arrested. I was disarmed, of course. My side arms were taken off. I was arrested and handcuffed and was led home and put in the clink, as you say, in the German army, I believe. Fortunately, I had put all these numbers down on the inside of the protective shield and also on a piece of paper. Also, my corporal, who was a very, very good man, had put all the numbers down. The corporal and I understood each other very well. He was a school teacher from Eastern Prussia and a very good guy. The next morning, then a number of officers, myself in handcuffs, and a number of the others, like corporals and sergeants, came together in a big lecture room. There were optical instruments, very much the same as they were on the guns, all positioned there, ready to go, except that there was no barrel attached. So now we went through the whole exercise the same way as we did out in the field. And as it turned out, the whole thing was not my mistake, but was the mistake of the first lieutenant who gave me the wrong number twice in order to give me the correct number for gun number two. Now that, of course, then caused a great celebration. Kreivich is out of the clink. Kreivich is out of prison. So, it means after the German artillery, it means after four o'clock, everything's off limits, including beer. And I don't think I ever in my life again, before or after, drank that much beer as I did that evening. It was also my misfortune that I was, was located exactly at the opposite end of the housing quarters. So every time I had the feeling in my bladder that, that something had to be emptied, I had to walk all that long distance down there and back. 
I was not able to sleep only one second that night, but as it shows, you survived. Everybody came with a full glass and said bottoms up. And that's the way it went, as long as they could still stand up. Fortunately, the beer those days, and you must consider it was already already wartime Germany, the beer was not very strong and probably only had three and a half or four percent. After just a few weeks, we were all transferred to the Lüneburger Heide, which is a stretch in Germany where a lot of heather grows, and we were trained there in handling the six-barrel artillery pieces, which, as it turned out, as I learn now, were the first rocket-driven artillery that were used in World War II. Each gun had six barrels, six barrels, very thin, relatively thin sheet metal with L-stripped welded or, or somehow fastened on the inside of this barrel so that the diameter of a shell you could slide through this opening would be six inches or 15 centimeters, I should say. So this became a six-inch rocket-driven artillery unit. After stationed a few days, several of us, I don't know if it was five or six or seven, went to, went on, I might call it a business trip. As it turned out, it was a pre-officer examination school for an examination for two days. After we came home, the major called three or four of us out and congratulated us that we had passed and would soon go on to officers' school. I, as usual, opened my mouth and told him I did not want to become an officer, which greatly shook up, I guess, everybody, because refusing to become an officer in the German army was taken as an insult and was taken very seriously, so I had a few stripes against me. The major told me to report to him at two in the afternoon. I did that. As I reported, he promised me that he would not punish me, but he wanted to hear the truth. And I told him I did not hold a lot of respect for the German officer because on the drill field, they were more punishing people rather than instructing them and hand teaching them how to handle guns and how to do good shooting. And after I had said that, he, he roared up and said, uh, you have insulted my officer's honor, and I herewith punish you by giving you a penalty of six months immediate active field duty starting tomorrow. So the next morning at four o'clock, I found myself boarding a train to to the battlefront. I remember very clearly that before that conversation, if you can call it a conversation, before that conversation ended, he told me he wanted me to find out how an officer's life is on the battlefront and how a common man's life is. And then after, after six months, he would call me back and ask me again if I didn't want to change my mind and I become an officer. So I went out to the penalty battalion, clearing mines for a while, and finally being transferred to a normal unit shooting six-inch artillery rocket-driven. Here came another accident. It was a little bit rainy day, and the battery was in position, and the front line called for fire very urgently. And the officer who was directing the whole battery, he said he couldn't see anything. He couldn't see anything. He could not give the numbers to the individual uh, artillery pieces because he, because he couldn't see anything. And uh, the captain called me and said, Krabich, you go do it. So I went and I just went there and I noticed that a drop of water had fallen onto his eyepiece. His eyepiece was at a 45-degree angle. 
which was surprising to me to build an eyepiece like that. But anyway, I took my handkerchief, wiped off the 45 degree angle, and gave the six individual units their numbers. And I think I wasn't even through with the, with the, the number six yet when number one already fired. And word came back, the fire lies fine, we need some more. And with that, the captain came and said, Krybik, you are now being congratulated to be a private. So that was my first promotion. It was caused by a raindrop. That's what you have to keep in mind. Raindrops can be important. I stayed with that through the battles around Berdichev, Kiev, all that, that middle central section there, until we finally ended up in June or so, 1942, Stalingrad. I think it was about June or July, and we ended up in Stalingrad. It was, we stayed in Stalingrad for a while and around Stalingrad, and it was then, it was then probably August or September, sep might have been September, even could have been early October, when the two or three officer people who had gone to officer school with me, who came from the officer school and and brought the order for me to return back home. And this is somehow strange. They brought the order for me to go back home, and they stayed there and probably stayed through Stalingrad until the whole thing was over. Stalingrad was such a well-known or well-publicized part of the war because so many people were enclosed. I hear different numbers. I hear 108,000, 120,000, 110,000, and out of those, only 8,000 came home. Some people say only 2,000 came home. I'm sure there are books that give the exact numbers about how many people were actually captured in in the enclosure around Stalingrad and how many made it back home. It was probably one of the biggest blunders of the German army that ever happened. After I came home, the major greeted me and said, well, you now, you look ready to become an officer. I again turned it down, and we agreed that I would join the medical corps, because in the medical corps, I could not be an officer unless I were a physician, and of course, I was not a physician. At the time it happened, I was of course not aware that I was a part of one of uh, those enclosed in the Battle of Kursk. Uh, during the night operation, I was the night operation at the Battle of Kursk. I was shot at from the back while I was bandaging a gunshot of a soldier. As it turned out, it was a Russian soldier. I was shot through my left lower arm, but it didn't hit any bone. I was bandaged and brought to the station and assigned for retransport to the further back line hospital. We were enclosed by the Russians at this time. At about 10 in the morning, three to four Yonkers 52 airplanes tried to land on a slightly snow-covered field to take us out. Apparently, it was not frozen enough. The first one that landed came down and tipped before it stopped. The front wheels broke and went into a ditch and the tail turned up with the merchandise from inside flying out through the front windows. Most of it was ammunition. This told the Russians that the German planes were flying in ammunition, not simply evacuating the wounded. The Germans immediately tried to get that plane's tail down and the wheels out of the ground, but I didn't pay much attention to it. All I wanted to do was get out of there. It was apparently the commander of those four planes who gave the sign for the other three that they also had to land. So, they landed and we were quickly placed into Yonkers 52s. That was my first airplane ride that I ever had. We were a total of about 25 to 35 people, most on stretchers because they were not able to walk. Two flying personnel, the captain and his assistant, 
and myself were the only standing members of the participants in this flight. All of us were put on one of the four aircraft. I didn't quite feel like lying anyway so I placed myself close to the door. The Yonkers 52 had two important doors as best I can remember. One went from the main cabin to the rear tail assembly. Through a short set of steps, you could reach to the tail gunner seat. At that time, they were flying without tail gunners because they were hauling injured. The second door was the main door and it operated just like a barn door. It was just on the side and next to the other door. I placed myself into that triangle corner where these two doors were and near the plane's left wing and left engine to see what was going on. We took off and lifted off, quite well, I thought, and started flying. You have to consider when you fly out of an enclosure, you have to cross two battle lines. There is the inner battle line that tries to keep the enclosure together. Once you get over the inner battle line, you get over the enemy territory, and then you get to the outer battle line of the enclosure, normally trying to hold on to these efforts. Over the inner battle line, it wasn't too bad. We received quite a few shots, some from machine guns and rifles. As a result, we had probably 10 to 15 more bullet wounds in the backs, lower legs and chests from the people who were shooting up from the bottom. These planes were not meant to be bulletproof on the bottom, so the bullets came right through. We were not doing anything about it. Of course, we couldn't. We were in the middle of the fight and we were flying quite low. What amazed me was that the pilot had received a bullet injury from the bottom. He told me because he knew I was a medic. I bandaged him as well as I could while in flight trying to stop his bleeding. The entry of the bullet was under his right chin, in the middle of the chin and the exit of the bullet was just below the right eye. He was bleeding, but he still kept on flying. He did not hand over the controls. The captain said he was flying about 50 meters, which would be about 150 feet above the ground, in order to minimize the availability of our exposure to such infantry firing. Also, he said that if he flew much higher, he would get into trouble with the Russian fighter planes and they would have a very easy target in shooting him down. That went on for a few minutes. Fortunately, he did pass that quite well but we were now headed to the outer battle line. I think it was a 3.7 or something that the Russians had, an automatic reloading anti-aircraft that they shot up and made a hit in the left wing somewhere. All I saw was the left engine peeling off with the rest of the outer part of the wing. The plane started to dip. It was a good thing he was flying low enough because he gently landed in some sort of a grass field. This was some time in March so not much horticulture was going on. Luckily our plane did not catch on fire when we landed in that field. As I learned later, these planes were equipped with carbon dioxide fire extinguishers over important fire catching parts of the machinery. Otherwise, we would have burned down right at that time. At the moment we touched down, I knew we were in sight of the Russians, and within a few seconds, the Russian artillery had us zeroed in and the first strike came. Now, having been on the Russian battlefront for that long, one knew exactly how they were shooting. The first one was far, the second one was short, the third one was left, the fourth one was right, and number five was exactly in the target. So, if you waited long enough after the fourth one, you had a good chance to think of going to the right rear. This was what they used. My battalion medic MD, Dr. Tenskirk, was also in that plane. Shrapnel had shattered his legs and he couldn't walk from a wound he received while he was on the ground. He came on the plane as a lying down passenger. When I saw the wheel came off the plane, I ran to the tail gunner seat. I got a big bruise on the left side of my rib cage. After a few seconds, I recovered and looked around and found Dr. Tenskirt on the stretcher. I took him out of the plane on the stretcher, told him to hold his arms around my neck, and we would run. I could do the running and he could do the holding on. After the fourth shot, we took off to the northwest there was a chance of making it. In those days nobody was overweight, just underfed. We made it a fair ways, maybe 200-400 feet before they fired the fifth shot. That, of course, put the airplane into fire. Those left inside were doomed. Penskert and I continued to retreat back, probably a couple thousand feet. We saw a Romanian farmer loading a wagon platform putting on sacks of some kind of merchandise. We asked him if we could ride along and he said okay. We jumped on and he brought us to the railroad station in Van Ahevsi. From Van Ahevsi, I had to buy tickets with German money. I found very quickly that we shouldn't buy any tickets. First of all, 
the German money wasn't worth anything and secondly, on the Romanian railroad it was cheaper to bribe the controller rather than buy tickets. I told Tenskirt that might work, but we didn't know how much to bribe. If you don't know how much to bribe, you might get into trouble. So, we jumped the train and we held a few unmarked bills out to the controller, he took a few of them and the rest of them I put back in my pocket. We continued until a normal passenger train stopped on the side of the line next to our train. It was carrying injured German soldiers. There we switched over to that train, which we should not have done. But we didn't really know where we were going on that other train. The soldier train made a couple of returns because apparently they had gone into dead end areas with the whole trainload. Eventually, we were unloaded in Pilsen, Czechoslovakia, which happened to be the hometown of the medical MD I had carried from the plane. In Pilsen, we stayed three days until I reported in and was promptly treated and sent back to the army. I don't know if Tenskirt is still in Pilsen now. We have lost track of each other. As far as I know, Tenskirt is only the second survivor of that plane load. The pilot might have tried to escape and gone another direction. In addition to being shot in my left arm, later in the war I was hit by artillery shrapnel in the stomach. It was, as far as I remember, January 1st, 1943. Battalion had been decimated considerably and we were in retreat for approximately a couple of weeks. At that point, new reinforcements were brought in from at home and I was one of those. The new arrivals were amalgamated with the old stock of the battalion during a short retreat period about 20 or 30 miles behind the actual front. That is also where we celebrated Christmas, if you can use that verbiage. On the last day of the December, we then we were then moved into the actual front line, which was a new line to be established. The Russians had obviously broken through the old lines, so there was no definite front line available at the same time. We were to establish that. The battalion commanders gave the direction, and the battalion was then ordered to be in that new formation. I have mentioned before that I was one of those very young and at the same time very stupid young soldiers. And I was at that time a member of the medical corps and therefore I was a member of the staff and considered that I did have a certain amount of personal freedom all the orders and establishment of the new line took place between probably 1 and 3 o'clock in the morning. If an attack was expected or not, this I did not know, and I would not have been informed of that anyway. After the line was well established, I noticed a couple or three uh, empty, very small houses in front of the line, maybe about 200, 300 feet. Dumb enough, I decided to go ahead, go into one of these homes and go to sleep because there was no action taking place and I was tired and could always use some sleep. Around 4, 4.30 in the morning, I was awakened by an extremely sharp sound, I recognized immediately that this was a Russian tank and upon the second firing of that type, I realized that this tank was sitting right next to the house in which I was sleeping. He was using the house sort of as a shield. You can imagine that I was awakened very much in a hurry and 
tried to orient myself, jumped out of my house and headed for the front line using a path in which I had hoped the tank would not be able to see me. In other words, I was hoping to use it that uh, angle. After arriving at the front line, there was a lot of calling, there was a lot of agitation, and around 7 o'clock or so, several more tanks of the Russian side arrived, and also a fair amount of infantry was behind them, or was following them. When I say a fair amount of infantry, I mean probably about 60 to 80 people or soldiers. The, the territory was nearly totally flat with a few ditches running here and there, but there was basically no way of hiding anywhere or finding shelter anywhere, except that away, maybe 400 feet, 500 feet behind the line that had been established, there was a fair-sized farmhouse with additional houses. One was especially a large, what I thought was a dog house. It was a little large for a dog and too small for much else. What was in there, I did not know. Around 7 o'clock, the action started with the infantry slowly engaging our infantry in combat. <coughs> the German battalion commander gave the order machine guns against tanks. He thus ordered that we would use our machine guns and fight against the Russian tanks, which was an utter stupidity in my opinion because there was nothing our machine guns could do to damage the Russian tanks. The Russians re recognized that very quickly and very simply took very smart combat action. One tank was posted on the corner of this huge square and the other tanks, and I think there were four or five of them, just simply drove crisscross through the people, through the soldiers lying in combat position behind their machine guns. Whenever anybody got up and wanted to run the tank who was sitting on the corner and supervising everything, simply fired a shot at him. I had early enough recognized what was going to come and moved myself back toward this farmhouse with the what I call doghouse. I was investigating the doghouse for a possible shelter because escape was, in my opinion, practically impossible. So for a while, the situation consisted of one Russian tank supervising this with the Russian infantry staying basically out of sight or getting involved very little, as little as possible while the rest, the rest of the Russian tanks, the three or four of them, maybe five, were driving crisscross across the field in which German infantry were lying on their stomach in combat position. They were simply driving through the soldiers and mauled them to death. It was an ugly picture when literally body parts like arms, heads, and parts of intestines were hanging in the, in the driving mechanism of these tanks, and one could see how they were being simply mauled to death. Since there was no practical escape, I simply hid myself in that little doghouse, or in the large doghouse. There was straw in front, I stepped, I put that further in front, and as the Russian infantry moved forward, I stayed in there and covered myself. And the battle was over. Actually, there was no battle. It was over in probably about an hour, an hour and a half, and then everything was quiet. 
after it quieted down, there was some Russian commandos and Russian speaking, which I heard clearly. Then the Russians started to celebrate their victory, and there was no question that it was a victory. And they did that in the usual way of breaking into a little singing, into some dancing, the typical the Russian dancing, as well as going to bread in the typical way with vodka. And vodka, they had enough. It lasted all day. They celebrated the entire day, became very inebriated, and in the afternoon, when it became dark, they went pretty well to bed and had had enough. They had cleared that part of the German infantry line, and that was their job, and the job had been done. As night broke on, I managed to escape, apparently unseen. They certainly did not watch very close, otherwise they would have seen me through a ditch formation in the uh, with a miniature valley, and I headed northwest. After heading northwest for a while, I noticed that I was tangentially moving toward a column moving northwest also. This turned out to be a Russian infantry column with small horse-drawn vehicles. In the winter time, with everybody wearing winter clothes, it was difficult to say who was Russian and who was German. So I very slowly and carefully, tangentially moved myself into that column. I walked with that column for a few hundred feet, careful not to speak to anybody because I did not speak Russian, and then veered off to the right and as the opportunity prevented where there were a few bushes, veered off to the right and followed my compass toward the northwest. I walked all night and all day next day. And the second night, I also spent mostly walking in northwest direction. On the morning of the second night, I then came to the German line, who were quite busy to shoot at me, of course, because I came from the Russian side, and it took me all sorts of weaving handkerchiefs and yelling to stop them from shooting at me with their machine guns. I did not realize was how much emotional stress had been placed on my system. When I came to the lines and it became known to the captain what num what, uh, from what battalion I was, I was immediately sent back to a field hospital quite a ways from the battlefront. That hospital had the target to collect the people who were left over from this combat situation. As it turned out, we were seven. We had gone into that combat with a battalion, with a full battalion, with 600 people. We were seven left at this time, being collected in a field hospital for recuperation. And it was certainly necessary. Many of us had a standby soldier because we would fall, fall asleep and then during the sleep get in, in a dream, fall back into that combat situation and relive everything again, jump up and become hostile. So these soldiers standing by had the target on to subdue us and keep us quiet. The process of R&R, &R, the process of trying to bring the nervous system back to an acceptable level took about close to three months, I would say, at which point we were sent back to our home units for reassignment because the battalion as such no longer existed. Experience of one day was so impressive that even now after
nearly exactly 50 years, I still have times when it comes back in my dream and I have a terrible experience trying to fall back asleep after this remembrance rolls through my mind while I'm half asleep. It is something I will emotionally have to live with as long as I live. Although I had some bad experiences after this one, at least I then found the strength to fight for transfer to a different division that was known of not pulling dumb stunts like that. I was a medical corps man at the time and would have made absolutely no difference to the Russians to shoot me had they discovered me. On the positive side, I must say, I have to give vodka a lot of credit for getting them so drunk that they apparently forgot about me completely. They had cleared the field by railroading individuals and admiring the body parts hanging on their tanks, on their driving mechanisms. The Iron Cross It was the summer of 1942. We were stalled and taking a beating somewhere near the Russian city of Vinnytsia. A Russian command center was thought to be located in a small nearby village, but none of our scouts or reconnaissance aircraft had located it. One day, our commander asked for a single volunteer willing to attempt a suicide mission. The objective of the mission was to penetrate behind enemy lines, find the command center, and communicate its coordinates back to the artillery unit. In those days, wireless radios were not used. Instead, the volunteer would need to strap a reel of wire on his back, cross the enemy line, and lay down a trail of wire that could lead the enemy directly to him. For some reason, I volunteered for this assignment, those days still being very young and dumb. I set out with the line of cable unreeling behind me. Somehow I managed to get behind the front line undetected and eventually I made my way to a hillside overlooking the village. For a while I simply observed the movement within the village and after some time I had identified several targets. This is where my earlier artillery training paid off. I estimated the coordinates of these target locations and communicated that information back to our artillery unit. Soon the shelling began. As it turns out, this raid was an extremely successful operation. I stayed at my position during the shelling and continued to relay new target coordinates back to the artillery unit. Some time toward the end of the shelling I heard a click and the communication line went dead. I knew that the enemy was now following that line and was headed directly toward me. I reasoned that any attempt to retreat back to my company would be suicide since I had been detected. So I decided to run down to the village and the incoming artillery shells. I managed to find a safe place in the village and hid there for about a day and a half. After that time, I successfully made my way back. I was given an iron cross for this mission. I did not keep the medal very long though since I would likely have been shot if the Russians discovered it in my possession. Nights in the trenches Russian winters were cold and German soldiers were not properly clothed for the conditions. Most of the time when clothing got wet, the only way to dry it was from the heat of your body. At one point during the winter of 1944, our company, usually 120 men, had been reduced to 12. One cold January day, 60 fresh replacements arrived. As typical, when they arrived, they were inadequately clothed for the conditions. We escorted them to their foxholes for the night. When daylight came, all but about 20 of these men had frozen to death in their foxholes. They never fired a shot in battle. I managed to survive these conditions by applying my knowledge of Russia, physics, and human anatomy. For example, when men were ordered to Russia, we were provided with new boots. I asked for a size that was two sizes too large. The other men laughed at me for this, but I knew that Russia was mostly a rural country and that there would likely be plentiful supplies of hay and straw to stuff into my boots. While in Russia, I was also able to find used fabric. I would rip or cut this cloth into pieces and wrap my feet with it. The cloth was much more comfortable than straw. 
With these oversized boots, straw and bits of fabric, I was never frostbitten the entire time. In our foxholes, we could not allow ourselves to fall asleep. The Russians seemed to know when this happened and would then quietly find and kill the sleeping soldier. So we learned to rest half awake, half asleep. As a result, we were in a sleep-deprived state most of the time. These conditions were on a soldier. Toward the end of the war, virtually no soldier believed he would survive. A man's vision of the future fell into one of two groups, one group believed that Germany would lose the war and the lives of their loved ones would be forever changed for the worse, the other group feared that Germany would win the war and would then be faced with an even worse fate of having to occupy vast areas of defeated land. This feeling of hopelessness led most soldiers to subconsciously seek the bullet home. This psychology was the underlying motivation for many acts of heroism. Beginning of the End Venezia was a really bad area in my memory. For one reason, the weather was very bad. It was constantly raining. A gentle and steady rain. We were soaked through to the bones. Finally, we ran out of ammunition completely and the Russians must have sensed that, so they staged a little attack to test out the situation. They found out attack to test it, and found out that we truly did not have anything to shoot with, so they came with a smaller attack and continued that soon finding out that we could do nothing but step out of the trenches and just go home. So they came without much shooting. And so as a result, uh, more and more soldiers stepped out of their trenches and went back. This continued slowly, although not with great hurry. So finally, some of the officers joined that crowd of giving up and going home. It sort of ended by the battalion commander coming forward with his automobile, I think it was a, a VW, jumping out and ordering all the soldiers back into the trenches, which resulted in a flat bad couple and word changing back and forth and yelling back and forth and nobody knew what was going on. Some people yelled that they didn't have any to do this. Others yelled that they were not going to fight the battle with the knives and so on. And finally, I think the battalion commander drew his handgun and fired and killed one of the soldiers, which resulted in a combat situation within the own troops, with the battalion commander being clubbed to death. And as far as I could see from the scuffle, the battalion commander being clubbed to death with the butt of his, his rifle. And these were the days on the battlefront in late spring 1943. So many of us figured that at that time already, the war had already been lost. In April 1945, I became, for a very short period of time, prisoner of the Russians, managed to escape and make my way into central lower Austria, central southern Austria, into the province that is known as Carinthia. Found refuge there for a few days until the war was over on May 8, 1945. I was therefore not caught by the Czechs and I, of course, could not enter Czech territory. They would have immediately shot me because I had nothing to wear but a German army uniform. Although I was from the, by birth from the original Austrian territory, since it had changed political classification in 1919, which was before my birth, I was being classified as a displaced person therefore not eligible for any unemployment insurance or any kind of financial support to live on. As mentioned before, in April, I arrived all run down after having fled Russian imprisonment. I arrived in the province of Carinthia at a farmhouse located approximately at the 4,000 foot level. Farming there was very poor and they always needed a lot of 
help from wherever they could get it. There I received room and board, and I worked from May 8, 1945, till September 17, 45, at this farm as a farmhand for whatever they wanted me to do. Most of the time, the heavy work fell to me because I was 23 years old and in physically relative good condition, although not very well fed at the time, but the farmer and his wife tried to make up for that. The accomplice who had fled with me spent most of his time trying to get the attention of the then 21-year-old daughter of the farmhouse, so they were most of the time together way out in the fields, and I was spending most of my time within the farmyard, as I mentioned before, uh, some more or less heavy work. The day normally started at 4 o'clock in the morning when I had to get up, go out, and cut the hay for the cattle, and after that was cut, brought in, and distributed. Then around, it was around 6 o'clock, uh, I had breakfast. On this particular day I'm referring to now, it must have been about sometime during the second or third week of May. It must have been during the second week of May, as far as I can recollect. I was assigned to split wood for bread making. In this area of Austria, they have a rather large stove. The wood that is being used is about a yard and a half long and has to be split in that length. And the uh, stove is that deep. And in that stove, a big fire is being made before the raw bread dough on a pallet is inserted and is baked. They historically bake bread twice a year only. They have a formula such that the bread keeps extremely well, so they only have to bake bread two times a year. The rest of the time they keep it in a room on the north side of the house, which keeps it fresh and well, ready to eat. On this particular day, I was assigned to split wood for that stove for baking, and that wood was a yard, so a little over three feet, a little over three feet long. So I was in the yard in front of the farmhouse. It was a nice day, it was sunshine. I enjoyed it. All I had on my body was uh, a pair of socks, a pair of shoes, shorts to cover my middle, and two, I had one or two axes probably handy, some wedges, and one or two mallets, very heavy sledges to drive those wedges through the woods and split it. I was happily doing this work. I enjoyed it. I always have enjoyed physical work, and so I did not pay much attention to my environment. Suddenly, it must have been around 11 o'clock or so, in the morning, I heard a loud commando voice type behind me. As I turned around, I saw two British soldiers in full dress and uniform, about six to eight feet behind me, stationed with two submachine guns pointed at me. As I looked at the situation and gave it a thought, I threw the axe away and started laughing, and after a few seconds, the British soldiers lowered their submachine guns and also started laughing with me. Obviously, they were also recognizing what kind of contest this was going to be. Since I had not had one word of English in school, our communication was very meager or they made me known that they were thirsty. 
there was a little water trickle running in the yard, and they first satisfied their thirst on this little trickle. Then one of the soldiers stayed with me, while the other one very carefully and thoroughly searched the farmhouse. He came back empty-handed because all the rest of the people were out in the fields, which were a fair amount away. After he came back from searching the farmhouse, they wanted something to drink, so I took a large pitcher and went to the basement, accompanied by one of the two soldiers, went to the basement and drew a pitcher full of hard apple cider, and I might say at this point that our farmer really knew how to make good hard cider. It tasted very well, and it had a good kick to it. After I brought it up, I poured two large glasses for them and one small glass for myself, because I knew that they would insist that I also taste or drink with them. After I brought up the cider and poured a glass for everybody, two large, one small, we started to drink, and I noticed that they took fairly good large sips because they enjoyed it. It was nice and cool because it came from a very nice, cool basement, and they very soon had the second and the third glass of this very good cider. This drinking went on and only got better. It went on for, I would say, about an hour, an hour and a half, and these two soldiers began to be very relaxed. They uh, took off all their leather or plastic machinery. They took, they took their submachine guns and threw them into the corner and started singing, uh, God save the queen, God save the king, God save, uh, God save anything. And uh, things were getting quite happy. I was getting a little bit apprehensive about it. As it then slowly started getting evening, I guess they felt they should return back to their quarters. And suddenly, it must have been around four o'clock in the afternoon, Suddenly, they hugged each other and uh, grabbed a few things and started walking downhill from the farmhouse. After a few seconds, I realized that I, for heaven's sake, would not want to be caught in possession of two British submachine guns and all their ammunition that goes with it. So I jumped up and ran after these two British soldiers, hung their machine guns around their necks in order to make sure that they came home with all their equipment. Failing to do so and being in possession of British submachine guns certainly could have resulted in a fair prison time for me. The reason why they were around was because it was the time very shortly after the end of the war when they were trying to round up leftover pockets from the German army, from the German SS, and trying to bring them in for imprisonment or interrogation or whatever. So they were going through the countryside, and of course everybody between the ages of 14 and 60 was a potential member of the German army. This was done throughout the entire co country, all through Austria and all through Germany, as I understand. There's no doubt there were still pockets of Nazi-type resistance here and there who were willing to start making trouble. When the crew from the field came back, I reported, and we discussed it, and we decided that we probably should go to the next city, to the British military station, 
and report to them what we had in mind is report to them who we were where we had been on the front how we got here and where we were working which farmhouse give them all the data we had imagined that they would immediately let us go back to the same farm and allow us to work there for the rest of the summer or until things became more organized. Fortunately, it did not turn out to be quite that way. On the next day, we borrowed some reasonably looking clothes from the farmer and walked down to the commandantur of the British establishment in Feldkirchen. That is not far from the Italian border in the province of Carinthia in Austria. Instead of being interrogated, and I must admit, I was very surprised what a perfect German the air interrogator spoke. I believe he was some sort of an officer, but he spoke perfect German. And at the end, he told us that we had worked in the medical corps, and that was being held in our favor. So our penalty, therefore, would be mild, it would be for two years building roads, bridges, tunnels, and transportation systems in general in Italy. In other words, to reconstruct Italy because Germany had done a lot of damage in Italy during this war or because of the war. Well, I must admit, due to my love for opera music, and by far the best operas have been written in Italian. Due to that love, I always wanted to learn some Italian, but I did not want to learn it in this way. As a POW for the British Army rebuilding roads in Italy. So I decided to try to watch and see what the possible escape routes might be and prepare for them. We were transported on a pickup to a camp, to a POW camp outside the city of Klagenfurt, a well-known camp established early in 1945 by the British. It was the head prisoner camp in that area. We were both amazed because we had expected a far more humanitarian approach being used. Upon arrival at the camp, we were interrogated once again, and again told that we would spend two to three years in Italy as prisoners of the Italian army for building roads, tunnels, and things like that. This really did not appeal too much, neither to my cohort nor to myself. So the first thing I did was watching for the guard system. The whole camp was about probably 200 feet by 200 feet on each corner tower erected from uh, wood having been put up with a little basket on top, the basket probably being 20, 25 feet above ground. One of the sides of this strictly quadratic enclosure was directly on the River Glan. That River Glan is a very active, well-known Austrian river that time of the year because it carries the early water from the glaciers early in the year. Therefore, the water temperature is very close to 32 degrees Fahrenheit 
also the water, the one edge of this square helped the growth of uh, plants very nicely. And on that side, grass, this heavy, thick grass, had already grown up to about three and a half, maybe four feet, maybe even a little higher. I observed the first night and again the second night that the British Army apparently had the same overall guard system as the German Army. That is from six in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, single post, from 10 o'clock at night till six in the morning, double post. So obviously, if one wanted to escape, the best time would be close to 10 o'clock at night when the last guard would be get ready to go off duty. And that is exactly what we did on the third night. The third night had also the advantage that there was a fair rain together with a thunderstorm and a lot of lightning coming down with the guard boxes on top of the guard towers being unprotected. They did not have any any protection up there against the heavy wind or against the heavy snow. They did have barbed wire coiled, or I should say uncoiled, inside and outside a six foot or eight foot high wire fence that had been put up. It was my my plan to make my way through these barbed wire obstacles and then jump the last guard about 10 minutes before 10 when he would go off duty. A few minutes before 10, then exactly, I jumped the guard from the back. He was, he was soaking wet. He, he couldn't care less. He was ready to go in, go off guard. I pushed him into the river and patted him on the shoulder, trying to indicate to him that I was not going to try to hurt him. And he knew how to swim, fortunately. He and I swam out into the, about the, the middle, into the center of the river, which was only about, I would say, 20 feet or maybe 25 at the most. And then I turned him around and motioned that he should go back to his shore while I swam, continued swimming, swimming to the other side of the shore. After I arrived at that shore and he climbed out on his side of the river, not much happened for quite a few seconds or even minutes. Apparently the cold water of around 32 degrees had chilled him to the point that he was not in a position to give a lot of commandos or talk to a lot of people. After just a short time, however, some English verbiage came up, and then they started shooting from the two machine gun towers. My cohort and I had run a fair distance by that time, and there were, in the fields, there was cabbage growing, and I still remember the, the bullets slashing. Fortunately, none of us got hurt. So we made our way, partially crawling on our belly in a, in a cabbage field, partially getting up and running a few feet. It was night. It was a vicious thunderstorm, a lot of lightning, a lot of rain, sometimes even intermixed with some, with some hail and some, some snow. It was the ideal situation for uh, breaking out. Now, we both knew the target. The target was the place where we had been at the farmhouse, and we were targeting to get back there again, which could have been really very stupid, but it turned out well.
I arrived next day late morning at that farmhouse and my companion arrived also next day but late in the evening at that farmhouse after taking a good stiff drink of which our landlord never had any shortage and uh, also drying up a little bit and changing clothes we were ready to go next day again and we stayed at that farmhouse for quite some time to come yet quite in general the summer was not very eventful i did a lot a lot of farm work cutting the grass putting it in for the winter helping with everything that needed to be done and to the best of my knowledge and ability played the organ for the priest in that little white church up on the on the hill that was located in the center of the town as it is usual in austria my cohort in the meantime sort of fell in love with the daughter of the house and it became obvious that some offspring was on the way sooner or later in comparison to what i had gone through before this was a very tranquil a quiet nice orderly life in an area that had not been touched by war had not been touched by people stabbing each other shooting each other killing each other or anything like that sometime during i believe it must have been august 1945 it became known that the british were dismissing members of the german army providing they had clear pass and providing they were austrian citizens now this of course was a problem for me because i was not an austrian citizen i had been born three years after austria was dismantled and the part i was born in had become czechoslovakia so i did not belong to the group who would be regarded as being suitable for dismissal from the army and this is where fortunately my organ playing paid out a little the priest for whom i played the church played the organ in the church every sunday or whenever he needed it to me a document declaring that i was an austrian citizen and had been born in a in a village of so and so that had been under his jurisdiction as a younger priest some years ago and that was very kind and very nice of him and with this document then i was able to achieve discharge from the german army on september 17 1945 in an orderly legal way so i was dismissed on september 17 1945 in a little city called sunk fight on the glan river in carinthia dismissal money i was dismissed as an austrian citizen dismissal money was 20 austrian shillings which was exactly 80 american cents with that in my pocket and good spirits i walked from st veit the road the country road to klagenfurt which is approximately 20 kilometers in Klagenfurt arriving in the afternoon I accidentally got in a conversation with an elderly lady who needed some wood split and put into her wood cellar so that is where I started I put her wood into the wood cellar and she gave me a little something to eat it was probably potato potato with something and from there on I worked handy whatever came in the beginning it was mostly cutting and putting away wood and coal for the winter time the wood and the coal was rashed highly rationed and had to be logged in small bags and kept in special cellars or sheds outside the living spaces of the people
Well, there are obviously very, very few males around. Many of them, of course, had been killed in the war, and many, many were still in imprisonment or were prisoners in foreign countries. So people were, especially women, were uh, looking for, for males to do occasional handiwork throughout the city. So it was no, no big problem. But it was a little problem to to get uh, enough money to make a living. I found, I was very fortunate that I found a place to live in the unused portion of a rather large church. There was one part of that church sort of had been blocked off. Why, I do not know. The church had been built as a square a bomb had been dropped in the center of the square. The windows had been broken. The windows were broken. I somehow secured a bag, a large bag, filled it with straw, and that was my bed. With that and an old army blanket, actually two army blankets, one that I covered the bag with because straw has a tendency to stick through cloth of all sorts, and this the second army blanket I used for covering myself because uh, winters can get quite cool in that part of the country, easily down to about 10 degrees or even 5 degrees, and without only having a little blanket, it gets pretty chilly at night. But I considered myself extremely fortunate because I no longer was homeless. For a very small amount of money, I found a lady who had five kids, and uh, the oldest one was about, I think, 20, and uh, she did receive a monthly check from the government to raise her kids, and she was willing to do the cooking for me. I gave her monthly a certain amount of money, and she put my money into the pot, the others, and then gave me a small quantity of food, whatever she thought was appropriate for the amount of money I had contributed. I was in constant search for two things. How could I further my education? And second, how could I continue to work toward a job of some sort and at the same time secure some income? This was all very difficult because the entire governmental system had broken down. Most of the buildings had been bombed out. As far as industry was concerned, there was nothing going on. Slowly, the public transportation started going a day at a time sometimes. I knew that without a valid high school diploma, I was not allowed to enter university anywhere in Austria. The problem was that my high school diploma, of course, was, quote, at home. That means the northern part of Bohemia, a province that had now become part of Czechoslovakia, occupied by the Czechs, and I couldn't dare to move in there to get my high school diploma because entering that part of the country, the Czechs recognizing a German army uniform would immediately have uh, shot me. I do not know how, but by some sort of luck, I found out that there was, of course, a fair size group of juveniles who were in the 18 to 22 age range who had been jerked out of high school and drafted into the army in order to serve in World War II. And they also did not have a high school diploma of any sort. For this group, the ministry of the province decided to initiate and conduct a uh, high school course, giving these people in concentrated form a high school backbone so they could then 
receive a valid high school diploma and enter a university. I personally went to the local high school director and requested permission to participate in this course. I was very swiftly turned down with the excuse that in order for him to accept, accept me for high school, I would first have to prove to him that I had gone to grade school. That, I thought, was going a little far, and I now took a chance and requested a discussion with the head minister for education of the province. He received me, listened to my story, and very quickly came to the conclusion that I was in a really terrible situation after World War II. I told him I had been to the director of the high school but had been turned down. He picked up the telephone and called the director and bawled, first of all bawled him out over the telephone and said to him, you have been all your life a Latin teacher in the high school and here comes a man who claims he has had eight years of Latin and if you are not able in five minutes to determine if he tells the truth or if he lies, then you don't deserve your job any longer. You will take this man and you will accept him as fully equal to the other applicants. With that, I went back to the high school. The director of the high school was already waiting for me at the, at the front door, and it was really funny. It's very, very typical Austrian. He shook my hand and said to me, Mr. Kreibeck, why did you not tell me when you came first, uh, the first time, why did you not tell me that you had connections? This is a very, very typical Austrian situation. So I entered the high school, but my problem, of course, was since I had no record whatsoever in that high school, I had to take all subjects and make final exam in all subjects. Besides that, the question came up how to make a living. As it turned out, there were other students, some of them very good in music, and we very soon formed a band of six people playing for country or jazz, weekend or weekdays, didn't make any difference. We made a lot of music those days. This was not on a regular basis. We were hired for, for an evening at the time and played for one night. And then for a few nights, there was nothing. D during fall of 45, winter 45, spring 46, I was busy trying to catch up with my high school learning and Friday, Saturday, Sundays, making music for the country folks who wanted to dance. It did not take very long, however, that we were approached apparently by one of the British officers who wanted to hire us on a more continuous basis. We then became more or less employees of the, of the British group of soldiers who were stationed there. They picked us up every evening at 6 o'clock at a given place in the city, brought us to a dance hall that had been prepared and rented by them, and then we played till 10, from 10 till 10.30. We normally had an intermission with a little food, then we played from 10.30 till 12, and from 12 until whenever we played for further further money and food until depending how the how the negotiations between our leader and the British people were going. This indeed was a difficult time because sometimes I had to play trumpet or violin till about three, four, maybe five o'clock in the morning and at eight o'clock I had to be back in school and I had only the afternoon to do my homework for school, but at least I had a relatively stayed, steady income and I was able to make a fairly stable living at that time. I never saved as thoroughly as I did in those days. The food we received was strictly rationed. 
And I remember going home once a week with a, with a ruler, strictly measuring out my loaf of bread and measuring exactly how much I could use every day so that I could make the bread last through the week. The same thing was being done carefully with the potatoes and everything else. In order to put the entire government and the country on a reasonable financial foundation, we had a money devaluation approximately every nine months. This always came in the great surprise. Uh, one simply woke up and found out that yesterday's money was no longer worth anything and new money was being printed and had to be issued. When one thinks back on these times, it is sometimes difficult to understand how we survived at all. To a large degree, it was probably the Austrian humor that kept all of us going. It was certainly 1947 or 48 that the overall atmosphere became better to a degree that it was slightly noticeable. All of us who had gone through that special preparatory course were certainly out of step with the normal school year arrangement. We started our curriculum in February 1946, so that means one half a year later than normal. Now became the challenge to the individual to make up for that lost time. I firmly believe that the environment of a foxhole with someone shooting at you every day and the environment of a university classroom do bring into your calcium cavity some kind of philosophy that cannot be expressed easily and cannot be described, especially not the differences that exist between the two. It's not easy to draw any parallels, and one might find it even very difficult to just believe that there is a different life now, that life is life again, designed to be more enjoyable from morning till evening that there are some values again somewhere.